people shouting. If you notice that I don't sing during the opening song or the closing song, it's because I can't sing. I want to make that clear to everybody. I praise God in my soul. I even stand here and clap my hands, but I dare not run you out of this place uh, trying to find the tomb. Uh, you people work with this thing just a little bit for me because I'm, I'm the oldest living preacher still active in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I don't think you heard me. Give me some respect and say amen. <laughs> I think some of you are deceived by my looks. My wife used to tell me, you don't look old. I say, yeah, but I am. Eighty-three years old, going on 100. And uh, sticking with that vegetarian diet, not because I want to go to heaven, but because I want to stay here. This is a dead house. You, uh, you, I'm going to talk to you people in the balcony. These people down here are sleeping. Something's crazy. I'll say it again. I'm sticking with that vegetarian diet, not because I want to go to heaven, because I want to stay here. Some of the best Christians on the face of the earth ate meat and still eat it. They are meat sanctioned by Scripture that a vegetarian cannot even argue about your right to use them. If you don't have good sense like me, I say, I'm a vegetarian because I want to stay here. If you are not, your theme song should change. I, I ain't got law. Stay here. Okay, now, that woke you up, didn't it? I, I know how to wake you up. I am an evangelist. Let me hear you say amen out there. Now, uh, my son came back there and had prayer with me before I came out here. <laughs> Looking as cool as a cucumber. I said, pray for me, boy, and he prayed for me. He's sitting out there somewhere in that crowd. He was one of General Beckton's boys in the heart of Europe during the Cold War. He was one of nine people manning a giant howitzer aimed at the Russians and keeping them stable so that you could worship here. I just thought you would know that. Well, what a day. Today, I was requested to give you a sermon in harmony with Negro History Week. I can't do that uh, alone. I've got to tell you more than that. But I will start by saying that prophecy has located the United States of America in the very last book in the Bible. Uh, this nation, uh, with its multiracial composition, composition, was allowed to come on the stage of action for a very, very important reason. You see, when America was born, the pendulum of history had swung all the way from Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, Greece, Rome, uh -huh, uh, Medo-Persia, I forgot them, let's do it again, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And if you study the second chapter of the book of Daniel and the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. You don't find the United States there anywhere. And, and I could not rest until I located her in prophecy because this is where I live. You talk to me about Egypt. Well, the Hebrews would have an interest in the Emancipation Proclamation that Moses brought down there one day and led them out after Jehovah had, hmm, had punished them with ten plagues. Well, those Egyptians had hard heads. After the first one, I would have let them out. But Pharaoh kept hanging on to those slaves. People who hold slaves want to hang on to them. Because they're lazy. I'm talking about the people that own the slaves. They're lazy. And to have somebody to do everything for you, including making the bed, 
Man, that's living the life if you can find anybody crazy enough to do that forever. But the Hebrews were not allowed to do that. Jehovah had another reason for them. And when you come to American slavery, the cruelest in the history of man, cruelest because Ellen White says uh, there was no hope for emancipation held out to the slave. The Hebrew could hold a slave, and that slave could work himself out of slavery in seven years. They're called the sabbatical years. You said, great. Practitioners of Islam could hold slaves, but if a slave converted to Islam, it was free. American slavery was intended to be perpetual. And those who were locked into that prison could see no way out. And the mystery, if it was a mystery, of how they ever got out, that story ought to be told, and it doesn't take five minutes. But I won't start there. I will start with locating America. Do you know Jonah? <laughs> Sit up and listen to me. Jonah almost discovered America. Uh -huh. You see, when the Lord told Jonah to go to Nineveh, which was an all-black city built by black people, you didn't know that? You need some black history. Cush begat Nimrod. Cush means black. And on that Nimrodic line came... Yeah, okay. Don't say I didn't help you a little bit here. But now, Jonah was born in a little old town called Gath Helpa. And the Assyrians used to cross the border there and kill off Hebrews and, and pester them no end. And then the Lord called Jonah and said, I want you to go to Nineveh. Now, Jonah was a Jew. Telling Jew to go to Nineveh and preach, gave him a sermon with eight words. Yet forty days, Nineveh shall be destroyed. Well, uh, Jonah didn't want to go up there with those Negroes. So he bought him a ticket and headed to Joppa. Some of you learned something already, but I've got more for you today. You see, telling a Jew to go to Nineveh was like telling a Negro to go to Utah and pitch a tent with the skinheads. <laughs> oh, don't, don't. You're not going to sleep on me. <laughs> I've got shock after shock for your head today. And all of it historically factual. Yeah. It was like telling a white man to go to 25th, 125th and Lenox Avenue and pitch a tent. He'd say, please, Mr. Custer, I don't want to go. So Jonah bought him a ticket, and the Bible says he hid it. He was trying to run from the presence of God. And he bought the ticket to the farthest city from where he was. Tashish, the country. Spain. Now, Spain is right at the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea, where the Atlantic Ocean dips into the Mediterranean, or the Mediterranean dips into the Atlantic. That the maps, M-A-P-S, the maps didn't show any other country further than that. That's why Jonah was stopping at Spain. Mm -hmm. Running from the presence of the Lord. Now, if America had been on the map, Jonah's ticket would have said, America. Ah, ha, 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 smarty. And so, and so, he headed for the farthest place that he could go, running from the presence of the Lord. Of course, he was intercepted by a God-created submarine and uh, wound up going over there to the Negroes anyhow. And he preached his seven-word sermon, and everybody got converted from the, from the king to the, God, to the sanitation engineer. 
Mm-hmm. This is a dead house, but I'll, yeah, I'll get you. Don't worry. Sit there. Now, 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 here we are looking for a nation that would become the dominant political force of its time. Mm-hmm. And Revelation 13, 11 identifies that nation as having the two horns, lamb-like, but roaring like a dragon. Now, eschatological studies clearly indicate that that's America. It doesn't pop up in Daniel 2, where Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome are there. And then there comes a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. That's the kingdom of the Lord coming in here. That's Daniel 2. It smites the image of civilization in the feet. That's down to the end of the world. You adverts know that. Uh huh. And it ground, G-R-I-N-D-S, grinds it to powder. That's human civilization. And the stone, which is the coming of the kingdom of the Lamb, fills the whole earth. Wait a minute, I skipped some Hebrew portrait. <laughs> Smoke the image in the feet. That's in the end of the world. And grinds all human history, civilization, to powder. Uh, here's the imagery. And, the, and it becomes as the chaff from a summer's threshing floor. God, God, I love these Hebrews. It becomes all of civilization. It's man's boasted uh, Kingdoms. When the Lord comes, like a great stone cut out of the mountain without hands, grinds human civilization with all of its history to powder, and the wind blows it away like the chaff from a summer's threshing flow. That's it. Mm-hmm. Where's that amen in this house? You're sitting up there like you deserve this. Say that again. Because I got some more for you, honey. Now, 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 now. But where is America? Mm-hmm. The prophecy skipped from Rome to the second coming of Christ. And no America is mentioned. So I've got to go to the last book in the Bible because America will be the last. Nation of universal influence that this world will ever see. Well, I finally got you here. Okay, took all that. Let's see now, let's see now. What about America so special? Well, well, number one, it's the place to be born right now. I don't know if you feel like I feel about being born in Huntsville, Alabama, but uh, being born in Alabama, way back yonder, is better than being born in most places right now. That's why everybody fights to get in here. People, when I travel, they try to buy my passport. I say, then how am I going to get back in? Answer, no. America's the place to be born. <laughs> People that don't live here long to come here, second only to go to heaven. That's right. Uh, the standard of living in America, good night, the poor folk are living better than most of the folk around the earth right now. Don't knock it, son. Good place to be born. But for black people, it was not always so. Now, I think you ought to know Hello, mighty still today. I'm coming to the gospel. I, you can depend on me. Took a long time, though, to get here, and it'll take a little more time to get there. Uh, the first black people who came here did not come as slaves. You ought to know that. 
Some of them were with Columbus when he landed over here, but history did not cough that up until the cities began to burn after the death of Martin Luther King. After that, they let it all out. It's all hanging out now. Black folk were coming in and out of here long before the Mayflower. Read Leroy Bennett's research. It's all sitting there. Uh, 400 blacks and 200 whites came up here from Jamaica. The Indians killed off the 200 whites, amalgamated with the black folks, and the church rolled down. You're a dead house. Is there an amen in the balcony? See, y'all the folk I'm talking to up there. Amen up there. These folk here, amen. Help them, Lord. Ah, Vasco de Gama. There were black people in the underage that came here with him. Just the early explorers coming here. Black folk with them. Esteban was here with Cortez, Hernando Cortez. George Bush. Uh, that woke you up, didn't it? Mm-hmm. George Bush was the first man to settle the state of Washington. He only came to the George from Texas. There's a monument in Seattle right now to the Negro. I went to see it so I could tell you it's there. He first said, Jean Baptiste de Sable. First settled in Illinois. These black folks, man. And I guess most of you never heard of Pompeii. And what's that other guy's name? Two big Negroes, both of them giants. They were with uh, Lewis and Clark when they uh, opened up the great Northwest, all of that. So you're a part of America before America became America. Is there an amen on that here? Yeah. All right, you people sleep up there, I'll switch to down here. Is there an amen on that up there? Yeah, let these people go. Let my people go. Okay, now with all that having been said, let's locate America now. Uh, the book of Revelation locates America between the fall of Rome and the coming of the Lord. That's right. Rome in Revelation 13.1, the coming of the Lord in Revelation 14.1, and that beast with two horns, like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon, the kingdom of the United States of America, comes between the fall of Rome and the coming of the Lord. There will be no other power exercising world influence after this one. I like that. And so, when this uh, nation finally got around to, to making slaves, God did to them what he did to Pharaoh. He sent ten plagues on Pharaoh to set the Hebrews free. He sent one plague on America to set the black man free. And that plague was the Civil War. Looked like it would never end. 840,000 of the flower of America's youth died in that war. The waters of the rivers ran red with the blood of the fallen. The rivers were the Chickahominy, the Pomunke, the Rapidan, the Rappahannock, the James, uh huh, and the Mississippi. The God of heaven would not permit this nation to remain half slave and half free. That's the only reason we are free. Jehovah, it was. Abraham Lincoln said the Civil War was an act of God. Let me quote him. He said, if it is the will of the Almighty that for every drop of blood drawn from the slave's veins with a whip, must be compensated for by a, blood, a drop of blood from America's soldiers. Let it be said that the judgment of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord, are true and righteous altogether. There it is. There it is. There it is. 
So uh, the Lord looked down from heaven and said, let my people go. Uh, the reason the black folk had survived slavery, you know, they tried to make slaves out of the white folks that they sent over here out of prisons. You know that. And they died like flies. Then they tried to make slaves out of the Indian, and he died like flies. They made slaves out of the African, and he multiplied and prospered. <laughs> Somebody out there knows truth in here. All right, so now what happens? Why did the black man survive? Number one, unlike the Indian, somebody let him have a Bible. And he found out that as a, uh, that low over his head there was trouble in the air. There had to be a God somewhere. You can't keep a man in slavery once he becomes aware that the God of all liberty has his eye on the slave master. He's just looking for some place to punch him and wake him up. That that's a human being that you're working out there like an animal. And the black man got hold of that God, got hold of Moses, started singing those freedom songs, started acting free while he was still in slavery, started singing some of those songs, cussing old master out. But they were so beautiful, old master didn't recognize what the black man was doing. <laughs> y'all, y'all know I'm telling you, sure. The Lord getting ready to let his people go. Black man survived because of his faith. Uh, he, he, he was picked. <laughs> it's like a like a like a slave standing ankle deep in Alabama red clay, picking cotton, singing, "I got shoes." This is a dead house. How about it up there? Yeah. Yeah, he's saying it. I got shoes. Negro had means for survival. Number one, he knew there was a God of freedom. And he knew that he was human. That's the Negro. Human. And he said, I got shoes. And as we do, we usually get carried away. The lead row Negro looked down the line, saw them cotton picking barefoot Negroes. He said, You got shoot! Then he got carried all the way away. He said, Oh, I got shoot! I got shoot! Slave master came riding by, took a look at that, said, You Negro, shut up. Ain't none of you got no shoes on your feet. The lead rule Negro said, yeah, we ain't got them on our feet. We got them on our minds. Hey, got them on my mind. So he had trust enough to know that if he kept shoes on his mind, his sons and daughters would one day get Stacy Adams on their feet. Did you hear this, Negro? I got some more for you. I'm a medicine man today. Boy, and have I got some stuff here. Now, the word came down from heaven, let my people go. Caddis Stevens and some other people in Congress signed the documents that set you free. Abraham Lincoln did not free you. The Emancipation Proclamation did not free one slave. It was the 13th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution fought over by unknown white people. That's why a black man can never just hate a white man. That's as bad as a white man just hating a black man because he's black. If it hadn't been for some black folks, we'd be still be out there picking cotton. 840,000 white men died so that we could live. Congress was all white in those days. We did not have a a Bana. What's that Negro's name? Did it, a Bana, uh, uh, some kind of. 
no, no. Wait. Who cares what his name is? He's there. <laughs> because, hey, Jehovah knew this, because there is no such thing as a monolithic white man. They argue with each other. And sometimes they fight. And the North and the South had a big fight. And we slid right between them. We still sliding. Who's that up there? That's the Negro who used to be down yonder. He's still moving up. He's in the Congress. He's in the Supreme Court. He's governor. He's mayor. He's a senator. He's a representative. So that's how we got through. That's how we got through. While the white man was fighting, we slid right on through. And look at us now. I don't see any barefoot Negroes in here. And I look around out at those cars that these black folk rode up in. Uh-huh. Don't feel guilty. Thank the Lord. Somebody got us out of that mess. And then... We were restive under our own oppression. Then Mark Vesic, Gabriel, there were slave uprisings. Negro wasn't just naturally docile, but he survived because he had faith in the unseen God. And I tell you this, we're not going to get any further without that unseen God, that stone. Came rolling through Babylon. Yeah! As of all people on earth, black folk ought to be serving the Lord. I said of all people. We ought to be closer to God than anybody, considering how far. God. This is what I came here to tell you. Young people, you're in a place of privilege right now. There used to be a slave down yonder, not far from here. We've got this graveyard down there. And if you ever start getting careless on this campus, you go down there and refresh your memory of how it used to be. My God, how it used to be. That we have some young people using the Oakwood campus as a playground. Oh, you dumb kid. You think your mothers and fathers can keep this up? They are bleeding to give you an opportunity that they didn't have. And some of you Coming in early in the morning, because mom and daddy don't know. they way over yonder in St. Louis. You are betraying every white man that voted for your freedom, and every black man that died trying to get it. Now, I've got some other things to say. Let me get them in here right there. Right, but don't you forget what I just said to you, kid. And when you walk out of this church, go out of here resolve that you're going to get your head into your books. And you're going to ask the Lord to forgive you for messing up down here. And you're going to quit wasting your time trying to be hip, hip, or hip 
All right, I got a little more here for you real fast. This is some inspirational stuff here. Uh, excuse me. Civil War. Let's get on past that. Oh, yeah, let's tell you two things, and, you know, that's all. That isn't all, but it'll have to be. Um, let me tell you why the Lord raised America up. Right down here, just before the second coming. He, uh, he needed a nation from which he could send missionaries legitimately to the ends of the earth, and they be respected. Now, uh, uh, Europe had run out of gasoline. In fact, the people that came here, the white folk came here, were running from Europe. There wasn't any pride in being a European. The original settlers that came here on the, uh, the Mayflower and the Maybe Flower and that other flower, they came here running from King George. Y'all know who King George was? Well, you ever heard of Bloody Mary? She was bloody. During the years of European domination of the globe, one of those horns on the head of that innocent lamb is called civil liberty. The other horn is called religious liberty. They were running to this country to set up, in their language, a kingdom without a king and a church without a pope. That's a quote right out of the history books. And when they landed here, right away, they violated the terms of their coming here with the Puritans and the religion that they set up here. You see, the Puritans set up a system of religion that would put a man in jail for working on Sunday. Now, that's not religious liberty. But they came here to establish a place that was where you were free to worship God after the dictates of your own conscience. But they did not do it. And Puritan religion became painful to its citizens. They violated the first reason for coming here. In short, one, hand, one horn on the head of that lamb-like beast was shaky at the beginning. And then when they brought slaves in, that other horn was shaky. The question then was, why did you come to America to establish, talking to the white folk who came here, why did you come here if you're going to bring here what they had there. And then King George with this taxation without representation. And the British, they brought the British flag over here. That didn't last long. Pretty soon there's a man named George Washington. And old George, <laughs> Jehovah raised old George up. He's a tough cookie. When George and his grenadiers got through, uh, they were fighting a thing called the Revolutionary War. 5,000 Negroes went there fighting with them. Mm -hmm. They ran King George's soldiers off of the land. And there came a man. I'm talking about religious liberty now. There came a man over here on a boat, a Baptist preacher by the name of Roger Williams. Oh, Roger was run out of England for believing in freedom of worship. Roger said the state has no right to dictate to the church, and the church has no right to dictate to the state. Church and state must remain henceforth and forever separate. That is one of the strengths of America. That's why you can sing, God, bless America. 
because America at this moment does not discriminate against religion. And a man can worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience. You better be happy for that. Because Europe had a 90,000, uh, uh, Europe slaughtered 90,000 Protestants over this one issue. And they came here looking for a kingdom without a king and a church without a pope. And that's what you enjoy right now. America, America. God shed his grace on me. Crown your good with brotherhood. Hey, I can worship on Saturday without the state coming in here. Telling me now, close your doors and go to church on Sunday. You can worship on Sunday without the state coming and saying, close your doors. And worship on Saturday. Oh. How have I heard that? Okay. Now, 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 listen, 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 listen. Here comes the punchline. Enjoy it while you can. This is a little lull in the struggle for human rights. And right now, darling, you're ahead. Right now. You have religious liberty in this land of the free and home of the brave. But don't bet on it forever. For the religious right is moving into the political arena now. And there are things shaping up here that are purely frightening. But you enjoy it while you can. Take advantage of it while you can. Because one of those horns is in jeopardy again. The... The, the religious liberty horn. As for the civil liberties horn, I want to tell you how to act while things are going pretty well in America right now. I didn't say you're in heaven, but boy, you're further from hell than you were. And I want to tell you how you ought to act right now. You better appreciate it while you got it. Because there are forces at work to try to turn back the civil rights thing. There are suits in court about admission to colleges that would throw you back into a discriminatory mode. But right now, Jehovah has got the law. When Martin Luther King got shot, Lyndon Johnson and Adam Clayton Powell, aided by the, the Warren Court, wiped out every vestige of discrimination on the law books of a nation. That's where you are now. And if you discriminate against, you can sue and get rich. There's a white man right down here in Alabama just did it. He was on a, on a, on a fire department roster. And they began calling him names. That Negro went to court. He's living on Easy Street. That just happened. There's somebody in here saw that in the paper. Somebody. Huh? Anybody? Oh, let me see your hand. Anybody? Have I got one witness in here that saw it in the paper? Yeah. Yeah. They asked the Negro, what you going to do now with all that money? He said, I'm going right back there on the job. <laughs> hey! I'm going right back there. And, and, and you can bet your life, ain't nobody going to call me a name. I'll have them right back downtown. And pretty soon, they'll change my name to Rockefeller. That's where you are now. Uh, uh, uh. You can say I pledge allegiance to the flag of the, of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice. Oh, you can say that, you know, because you're so far out of the hole that you can say that without coughing. Uh, America's conscience has responded and and, and bless your heart, things have gotten so much better. I used to fly airplanes back when there was only one Negro on the plane. Only one. I used to get on them. By the way, I did 38,000 air miles last year. I'll be in California next Sabbath. I was up in the icy uh, slopes of Michigan last Sabbath. 
I wouldn't be here today except for this appointment with you. And uh, I want to tell you something. Uh, my wife and I, way back yonder, when you would see one Negro on a flight, it was just that. And they'd want to know if you got on there, what profession are you? One Negro in a sea of white. Ah, but has that changed? You know, we got some fools, some black fools in America. Yeah, they, the more things change, the more they remain the same. You're a liar! <laughs> if they change, they change! And I'm living proof! They change! My wife and I got on, uh, on, uh, Delta Flight 1505 from Atlanta, Huntsville. I did the usual thing when I got on. I peeped into the cockpit. See who's flying this thing. Because it's what's up front that counts. This is a dead house. Let me talk to the deaconesses. They'll listen. Yeah, it's what's up front that counts, sisters. Forget these other people. Uh, and, 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 and I peeped around there and there's a black brother sitting in the captain's seat. Four straps on his shoulder. I'm telling you how to act now. Things are changing. Don't act like they haven't changed. You're a fool if you, you're blind if you can't see. You're going into restaurants in Huntsville, Alabama that should have been put in jail for. Is an amen in his house? Yeah! The changes are taking place. And, 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 it, and it'll do you no good, still with a sour face, as if you're back in slavery. No, you ain't. You're lying to yourself. Uh-oh, back on the airplane. I went up there and saw that black brother getting ready to fly that plane. I sat down next to my wife. I said, hot dog. She said, no, Earl, you're a preacher. I said, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> The white folk got on the plane and saw who was up front and went into committee meetings. I know what they were discussing. They were discussing the efficacy of the, uh, you know, the sociological experiment with a view to uh, possible termination or terminality. About that time, the door was closed and locked, and they were in there with me. That black brother fired up those engines. Uh, oh, they like we do. <clears throat> Don't get embarrassed. You know, we kind of gun them a little bit. Get used to what we're enjoying now. If you don't, you ought to and appreciate it because it used to be rough, son. Rough. I was born in 1921. I can tell you how it was. I said 1921. Those white folks suddenly found themselves locked in because a white stewardess locked the door. So now they are part of the experiment with me. None, none do but sit down and did they buckle up. Click! That black brother taxied down the runway, gunning those engines, spun it around like we do, and then took off into the wild blue yonder. Twenty minutes later, he was over Huntsville, dipped his wing, slid in with a professional landing, not even a jolt. That's better than some of the other folk I've been fly flying with. He slid on in there. Oh, shut up, you're not even here. And, 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 and he pulled up to the gate and sat down while the others got out. I said, Seal, i got to shake his hand. After all, he got me there. Everybody's out. I walked in there, walked up front. He was sitting out, cooling off with his hat off. I said, I see your name is Captain Earl Evans. He said, yes, from Oakland, California. I said, meet Captain Earl Cleveland. He said, you an airline pilot? I said, no, I'm a preacher. I fly them higher than you do. <laughs> this is a dead house. Oh, shut up. You're too late. You're too late. Just shut your mouth and let me finish. I'm trying to tell you how to act. Enjoy this stuff. I keep walking around with a sore head, still singing down on me. Get stuff in a theme song now. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? Is there an amen upstairs? 
It is of another thing stand now. Because look, the iron doors are no longer locked. I don't care what your color is. You can rise. You can make it. Whatever you do, get good at it. That's why you cannot waste your time in these classes. I don't want a, a dumb doctor working over me. Come out of here, ready to rumble. Okay, okay, I'll let you go. Let you go, let you go, let you go. So then we we ought to be in an attitude of let's make it while we can. Let's take advantage of this opportunity while it's here. While there are government subsidies, let's get them and get in school and let's apply ourselves and quit messing around. You could have stayed at home and done that with least expense. Okay, okay, okay. So America has become a pretty nice place to live. Ah, uh, yeah. One more little story. I went down to the Vermont Avenue Baptist Church in uh, Washington, D.C. Martin King was speaking. And he said uh, in his sonorous voice, I want to speak a parable. I want to speak a parable. He said, a white man, the Hebrew, and the Negro went to heaven. And Gabriel, who was in charge of dispensing wings, called the white man and pinned two wings on him and said, perform and demonstrate your worthiness to stay here. White man took off on strictly geometric lines, wasted no motion, did a few modest things and landed. King said, Gabriel said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And he called the Hebrew and pinned two wings on him and said, Now perform and demonstrate your worthiness to be here. Hebrew took off, economizing on fuel. <laughs> he had a few modest movements and landed. King said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Then he called the Negro, and he said, Brother, come here. And he pinned one wing on him. Does that sound familiar? But the black man didn't stand there pitting himself. He revved up that one wing, King said. Set down the celestial runway, spun around, and beating with that one wing with double velocity, <laughs> straight into the heavens, did a few belly rolls up there, you know, like we do. I spun it around, and when he got to his last movement, one of the inhabitants of the city said, Gabriel, who's that up there? Gabriel said, that's the Negro. He's demonstrating what he can do if you give him a half a chance. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, he's still up there. Yeah, okay. In conclusion... In 14.1, we're brought face to face with the Lamb. And the kingdoms of our, this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. Just ahead of the time of trouble, the 
the work of God will be finished. And angels who have done their deeds of mercy will fly away. And there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. That time is upon us. That time is upon us. So seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is nigh. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy and to our God who will abundantly pardon. I know he's like that because I found him to be a mountain mover. He's been a sin reprover. He was the bleeding lamb. He's the great I am. Hope of the race, God of grace. He's a way maker and a habit breaker. He's a load lifter, a star receptor, a shock absorber, mm -hmm. a safe harbor, a pain killer, and a storm stiller. My rock, my sword, my shield, my wheel, in the middle of the way. And he patrols this room right now, looking for one honest man, one honest woman, looking for one honest girl, one honest boy, who will seek first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. And let the Lord add whatever else he wants to add. And that's why I came here today. I came here to do what you see me do right now. Everything else you saw and heard, I was no more interested in that than I am in this. Because at this moment, I'm looking for a marriage proposal. I'm looking for somebody who has been a little slack now, a little careless about your prayer life. Haven't come to him. God bless your son. Have a seat here. Have a seat right there. Haven't come to him and prayed as he told you. Without ceasing. Pray like you breathe. And strength will come to you for your weakness. It gives me joy. Cast out fear. It gives me sunshine for my shadows. Sunshine. Beauty for ashes. Right here, right here, right here, right here, right here, right here, right here. And I know somebody needs that right now. Some beauty for his ashes. I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to make an offer to you. I'm getting ready to fight Lucifer for somebody right here. If you used to be a good, firm Christian, but you know you've fallen behind in your dues. If you're in the balcony, the main floor, don't worry about it. I'm waiting on you. I want you to come down here. You want to come back to the Lord? I want you to come down here. I'm going to do what I've been doing for 63 years. On, on six continents, I've been fighting devils. I want to fight with you. Whatever weakness is over. 
overcoming you. Shut second in your salvation power. I want to fight with you. I want to fight for you. So when I tell you, if you fall into any of these categories, come on down here, you and I are going to have a fight that the demons are going to be talking about for the rest of their natural lives. Bless you, child. Just stand right here. Yeah, stand right here. Uh, if you used to be a good Christian and you want to come home, that's I'm calling you. If for the first time you, you've been convicted, I need some preachers. Anyway, out of the audience, anywhere. Come on, I need you down here with me. Uh, listen, if you used to be a good Christian, you got away. You want to come back. If, 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 right now, you're trying to get your act together and you want some help. I don't know but one thing on this earth. I wish I was good at everything. I don't know but one thing. And that's how to pray for people who need the Lord. And you need them now. Get up and come on down here. Don't wait on the song. And one more thing. One more thing. If for the first time you felt the hot breath of the Holy Ghost, like I have, sweep over your soul in this room, first time. Come here, honey. Come here. Let me plead with Jehovah for you. I don't know how to do anything else. I don't know how to do anything else, but I sure don't know how to do this. <laughs> Sixty-two, three years fishing. Come on out the balcony, honey. You're not too far. And you're not outside of divine grace up there. Get up and come down here and let me talk to Jehovah for you. God knows I know how to do that. It's all that I know how to do. You want to stop doing what you're doing that's ruining your life? Get up and come out of there. Just come on. Forget the people that are behind you, beside you, in front of you. They've got no heaven for you. Come on home. Somebody start that past me not. Who's supposed to be up there? Somebody. Don't, don't kill any time, child. Get it going. Anybody up there? Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, son. I'm out. Let me wrestle with Jehovah for your soul. Come on. Don't waste time. And don't be ashamed. Because that's what church is for. Hospital is for sick folks. Church is for those who need spiritual healing. In the name of God. Come on out from up there, boy. There's no glue holding you to that sea. Yes, 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 in the name of God, yes, yes, come on, young people, come on. come on, don't stay glued to your seat. Yeah. 
spiritual is going on in this room. Jehovah is invading the secret channels of the human heart and the invitation is registering there in human hearts now. What could be more exciting? What could be more wonderful? And while the grace of God lingers, I'm going to ask you to sing one more stanza, or sing the old stanza over, and do the chorus, and then I'm going to pray. Yes. Let me at the throne of mercy. Let me at the throne of mercy. Anybody else? Anybody else? Let me at the throne of mercy. One more time. Anybody else? 
Jehovah for our lives, yours and mine. Yes. For you see what I've done for 63 years has always been dangerous business. Lucifer has, has not liked me because I've been poisoned to his kingdom. He's attacked me in so many ways. Only Jehovah can enumerate them. But look at me. The Lord has helped me to survive him. Oh, my God, this morning I thank you for coming into this room. I thank you for sanctifying lips of clay. I thank you for talking above my voice and reaching into human minds like no human being can, and rerouting thought processes, penetrating to the level of motivation in human minds, and there creating new creatures in Christ. You know, I know that's what's been going on in this room. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you. Let each one of these who came to this altar depart in hope. Let them walk away from here knowing that Jehovah has done something for them, to them, and in them. Let them not lose the victory gained at this altar, for this is the altar of victory. I pray this prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless you all. And, Brother Pastor, whatever you do, you do that. God bless you. God be with you. Yes. God bless you, little guy. God bless you both. God be with you.